حرفا ترى قص في اختيالي وأنشد زاهيا بين التلال لدار العلم يصدح بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله الأحد القهار وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون Indeed all praise and thanks belongs to Allah tabarak wa ta'ala We seek his help, his assistance and guidance in all things He whom Allah tabarak wa ta'ala guides there is no misguidance for him And he whom Allah tabarak wa ta'ala leads astray there is no guidance for him Except for the will and Permission of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala alone. And I bear witness and testify that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib al Hashimi al Qurashi was the final messenger and prophet sent to all of mankind, O you who believe. Fear Allah as He deserves to be feared and do not die except in a state of Islam, do not die except that you are Muslims. Amma ba'd, Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlil uqtatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we have reached lesson 13. And this <coughs> chapter that we will begin to read and the next chapter, inshallah, if we get to it, is a continuation of the previous chapters. And it is essentially covering the relationship between Qadr and the relationship between Qadr and Dua. But we will begin, inshallah, uh, with the old uh, edition, page 37. Uh, the chapter supplication is a powerful means. Supplication is a powerful means. Ibn al Qayyim rahimahullah says supplication is amongst the strongest means. If the objective that is being supplicated for comes to pass, it would not be correct to say there is no benefit in supplicating. As it is not correct to say there is no benefit in eating, drinking or any movement or action, there is no other cause more beneficial or profound than performing a supplication in attaining the object- objective. For this is... Yani, a continuation of the previous chapters of Qadar And the main gist Or the main topic that is yani, covered Is taking the means for an objective Taking the means for an effect And what it is basically trying to cover Is that if dua is not effective then with that logic, drinking or taking any other means is also pointless. Yani a continuation of the last uh, paragraph of the last chapter. For using the same logic, he's continuing to say that dua is the most effective means to achieve any cause. And... Then Ibn Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi continues and says Since the companions are the most knowledgeable people in this nation about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and those who held the most astute understanding it is only appropriate that they were the most accomplished in implementing this means its conditions and its mannerisms than anyone else Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an would seek to triumph over his enemies with it and it proved to be his mightiest force. He would say to his companions, you are not granted victory due to your large numbers. Instead, you are granted victory from above the heavens. He would also say, I do not worry about the response. Rather, I worry about making the supplication. If I have been inspired to supplicate, then surely the response comes with it. 
Then Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi says, a poet carried this meaning and composed it in a line of poetry. He said, if you did not want to give me what I hope and ask for from your generous hand, you would not have made me accustomed to ask. So, this is very beautiful lines of poetry and a very, very important topic. But basically he starts off by declaring the status of the companions radiallahu anhum by saying that their position with the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is something that is established the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said khayrul qarn khayrul qurun qarni thumma alladhina yalunahum thumma alladhina yalunahum the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the best generation is my generation then those that followed them and then that follows then those that followed them for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying that this is the best generation the, the generation of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and their knowledge of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is unparalleled the understanding of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is unrivaled no one has that depth of level of knowledge about the Prophet and his Lord than the companions. And this is from the Shahada of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by saying the best of this Ummah is my generation. The best of the generations is my generation. For if we look at this as their position, that they are the best of this Ummah, then we have to take their guidance as a guidance. Their example as a guidance. For if it means that dua is a weapon, how did the companions use it? If we say dua is the weapon of the believer, as mentioned in يعني, two chapters before this, dua is the weapon of the believer, how did the companions use dua as a weapon? Ibn Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi said that Umar radiallahu an used dua as his weapon against his enemies. And it proved to be the mightiest force that he had. Fa Umar radiallahu an in the Athar that Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi brings, he said that you are not given victory through your numbers. It's only through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this has يعني, an example from the lesson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he went to Ta'if after Fath Mecca. And this was the first time that the Muslims had a great number of men. And they went into Ta'if and because of this false sense of assurity that they had, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala initially made them to lose a lot of people. To not be in a, in a place of power and they were ambushed by the people of Ta'if from يعني, the mountains and a lot of them had to retreat, the Muslims. For this was a lesson from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the companions that you are not victorious through your numbers. You're victorious only through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the opposite was true in the, in the lifetime of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like Badr. Where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with 313 men took on three times that size. And more. For this is something that is established in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if we look at the dua that is present in the Quran and the Sunnah, how many a times do we find فَنْصُرْنَ عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ Or du'as like it, where we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us victorious over the disbelievers through du'a, through du'a. For this is something that is very, very important for us to understand. But what we also understand through this is the yaqeen of the Sahaba. The yaqeen of the Sahaba. And the result of that yaqeen and tawakkul with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To have conviction and faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we look at what his second statement was, is that we don't worry about the answer or the response. We have to make the effort to make dua. And we have conviction and yaqeen, certainty and faith that the answer will come if we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
For upon us is to make dua, not to worry about the answer. The response will come. The response will come. But for the response to come, you can't expect a response to come except through making dua. And that is why Ibn al-Qayyim is bringing these two athar uh, to us. And if we look at the result of يعني, the yaqeen of the Sahaba, specifically Umar, the time and the khilafah of Umar عن, was one of the golden expansions of the Muslim Ummah. But it was victory upon victory. In the time of Umar radiallahu an, one of the greatest victories that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to, visit, to view in our lifetime once again was the opening of Palestine. Palestine. And this is something that if we see how they did it, how they achieved it, was through this. Victory is not given to you by your numbers. It's given to you by the one who's above the heavens. By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that inshallah, I hope is يعني, a little bit clear. And then Ibn Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi says, So whoever has been moved to perform, perform a supplication, then it is inevitable that a response has been desired for him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ مُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, invoke me, I shall respond to you. And he also says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if my servant asks you about me, indeed I am near. I respond to the call of the one who calls. For these two verses, we covered it last week, which was an evidence for what Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi is bringing, that to get a response from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you need to call unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ud'uni, you call unto me, astajib lakum. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you call on to me, then I will respond. Not that the response will come without a call. And then the next verse, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in, in the verse that Ibn Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi brings, Ujibu da'wat al-da'i. I respond to the call of the caller. For the call needs to be made for a response to come. And... Also, what is يعني, important to note with these two verses is that these are the promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, call unto me, I will respond. There will be a response by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For this is something that when you do make dua, you have faith and conviction that you will get a response by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, Ibn Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi mentions, and in the Sunan Ibn Majah, on the authority of Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu said, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever does not ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes angry at him. Now we took this hadith previously and this hadith is Hassan. This hadith is Hassan. And then Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi mentioned, subhanallah, this next part should be written in words of gold. All this is evident of the fact that Allah's pleasure is sought through asking and obeying Him. If the Lord is pleased with you, in that is everything, in that is everything that is good, in contrast to His displeasure, wherein lies every calamity and tragedy. This statement, subhanAllah, is very, very important. That inshaAllah, I want to go into just a little bit of depth, not too much, but inshaAllah, in Al Qayyim Rahmatullah, uh, he says, Fakullu khayrin fi rida. That every goodness is in the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And just as every calamity and tragedy lies in his anger and his displeasure. Subhanallah. Every goodness in the dunya and the akhirah can only be achieved how? Through the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The everlasting Good can only come through pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And the opposite is true. Is that the everlasting punishment is only going to come through the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his protection. That if you want goodness and ease, then worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will gain the goodness in this world and the next. And the opposite is true. If you want worry, sadness, depression, anxiety, a heart that is hard, a heart that is heedless, then the way to achieve this is through the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that inshallah Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullahi is going to go through very very soon and in next week class inshallah also on what is the source of pleasure of happiness and what is the source of goodness and what is the source of evil then Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullah alayh brings an athar that is found in the Zuhd of Imam Ahmad he says Imam Ahmad rahimahullah record, recorded a Qudsi narration in the book of Zuhd, worldly abstinence, quoting, I am Allah. If I am pleased, I bestow blessings, and by blessings, and my and it says by blessings, it should be my blessings, and my blessings have no end. However, if I am displeased, I afflict a curse, and my curse reaches the seventh child. My curse reaches the seventh child. Now, this athar is actually taken from the Akhbar of Bani Israel. <coughs> it's not a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is from the narrations of the Israelites, from the Jews and the Christians. For this is a statement that we can do without. Ibn uh, Sheikh Abdul Razak bin Abdul Muhsin Abbad said that had Ibn Qayyim Rahmatullah Alayhi, and he sufficed with the first verses and the hadith, it would have been sufficient. But something that is very, very specific is the statement at the end my curse reaches the seventh child this statement in our sharia is problematic that how can the seventh child be afflicted by a curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through no fault of his own this child is born and he's copying it for something that his seventh grandfather did haram alayh and it's not something that's it doesn't make sense in our Sharia because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَلَا تَذِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وَزِرَ أُخْرَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 164 in Surah Al-An'am that وَلَا تَذِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وَزِرَ أُخْرَى that no bearer of burdens shall bear the burden of another person يعني it is something that we have to understand that you will not face the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala especially in the akhirah for something that you had nothing to do with you had nothing to do with yani, or it goes on the opposite as well that if your seventh grandfather was very very good had he even been the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it doesn't benefit you and your actions your actions is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will be judged according to what you do not what your grand, grand, great grandfather did that is something that is very, very important to understand. And again, يعني, the a hadith that I mentioned is Hassan previously. And there are, uh, there are verses from the Quran. So inshallah, this is uh, an athar that we don't really need. Then Ibn Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi says, Moreover, it has been identified through sound intellect and text, natural inclination, and the experiences of the various nations, regardless of the cultures, faiths, and creeds, that a devotion to the Lord of creation and the pursuit of His pleasure, righteousness, and benevolence to His creation are all from, are all from the most powerful means of attaining all that is good. And their opposite actions are the greatest reasons that entice all that is evil. There has never been anything as significant in achieving the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and repelling the harms than obedience and a devotion to Him and benevolence to His creation. This is يعني, another 
very important uh, paragraph, but basically what it is, is a summary of what came before, that good deeds only bring about goodness. Good deeds only bring about goodness and the opposite is true. Bad deeds only bring about bad. Evil brings evil, good brings good. And this is something that is mentioned in many other faiths, as Ibn Qayyim is saying, that it's يعني, found in every text in the previous nations, that devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can only be good. Something that, يعني, he says, it's from the fitrah, it's from the sound intellect, the natural disposition of a human being. That this is what we are يعني, created with. And something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, is not the reward of goodness, only goodness. Doesn't good only bring about good? This is something that is really, really important. But how does this relate to dua? What does all of this have to do with dua? Yani he's saying good brings about good, bad brings about bad. What does all of these narrations, previous to this, what does it have to do with dua? One of the salaf, he stated, and I think we might have taken this in one of the previous classes, Allahu Alam, but he said, I pondered over what is the greatest form of worship? What is the greatest form of goodness? Yani what worship is the best, most effective, most effective, most efficient? What is it? And he said, I did this because there are many good deeds. Salah is good, Siyam is good, prayer and fasting is good, and other good deeds. But what is the best form of worship? What is the best form of goodness? And he said, Every goodness is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we are not able to do anything from that which is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, I came to realize that dua is the greatest form of worship and the greatest goodness. A supplication, that dua is the greatest form of worship because you can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow you to do everything else. So when you do that, it means that dua has a special power. That it is the door for all other goodness. So this is one of the salaf stating that dua is the greatest form of worship. Dua is the greatest form of worship. So this is why Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi, is saying that goodness only brings about goodness after replying to the question regarding the relevance of dua. Last week the question was why what's the point of even making dua if everything's muqaddar? Fa he is establishing that dua is a worship. Dua is a worship. Dua is goodness. It's a means to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Its effect is that it will only bring about goodness. Its effect will only bring about goodness. But the one who abandons dua, the one that is mahroom who is not allowed to make dua, will face misery, trials, tribulations, because he is looking elsewhere. He's not looking towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's looking for every other avenue other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi mentions in his book, this is very very important for the next chapter, this يعني, it's actually this paragraph should have been in the next page. Because it has a rabt with the next يعني, line that comes after. For, يعني, if you want to understand the next uh, paragraph, the next uh, whole chapter actually, which is a few pages, you have to really understand this, uh, this paragraph. Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi says in his book, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has arranged that anything that is good or bad in this world and the hereafter be attained in accordance to actions. Anything. Good or bad in this world or the hereafter is attained in accordance to actions. That's the statement of Ibn al-Qayyim. And he needs to be broken down a little bit. Anything 
good or bad, in this world or the hereafter, good or bad, in this world or in the hereafter, is only attained in accordance to actions. Yani, a good action results in goodness in this world and goodness in the hereafter. A bad deed brings about bad, evil in this world and evil in the hereafter. Yani, the main point of this is kind of reversed. Is that you can't expect to get good if you don't perform goodness. Or if you perform evil, you can't expect goodness. The cause has an impact on the effect. And inshallah, he's going to يعني, continue this. يعني, the main point is, is everything, everything is attained in accordance to actions. You can't expect results with no action, good or bad. Don't expect evil if you do good. And this is something that's very important as well. And we always focus on don't expect, if you're doing bad, don't expect good. But the opposite is true. Don't expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to punish you if, you if you're doing good. There's a general, a lot of the times you see this, is that people have this anxiety with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this Yani over fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is actually yani, not the position of a mu'min. You should be between fear and hope. Not just only fear and no hope. For if you are doing something, you're coming to the masjids, you're being regular with your prayers, you're doing your fast, you're doing your charity, yani, have husnavan with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. For this yani, is a very, very important qaida that anything good or bad in this world and the hereafter, is attained in accordance to actions. So Ibn al-Qayyim, rahmatullah alayhi, then continues and says, this applies, and this is يعني, the main point of this, this chapter and the next chapter, this applies to the recompense being in accordance to the meeting of the condition, the reason, and the outcome, and the cause and the effect. And then Ibn al-Qayyim, in the next page he says, and the chapter heading this time is actually from the statement of Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi. Evidence of this can be found in the Qur'an in over 1,000 places. And it's connected. Go jumla by jumla, statement by statement, inshallah. I can see a lot of confused faces in front of me. He says, Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi, that this qa'ida, this principle, that everything good or bad in this world that the hereafter is only attained, through, through what? Action. And he says this is the case with three things. The first, Tartib al Jazai ala Shart. Tartib al Jazai ala Shart. Recompense being in accordance to the meeting of the condition. Yani, this is, all of these need examples to make it a little bit easier. Yani, the recompense of theft, what is it? The hand. Sahih. The hand. But what is the condition of taking the hand? Theft. For the recompense being in accordance to the meeting of the condition, يعني, for the recompense to occur, the condition needs to occur. For there is a cause and effect here. For a recompense, there needs to be a condition or something that causes the recompense. For can a hand be cut for theft without theft? No, there needs to be that action that causes a response which causes on the recompense. Then, Ibn Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi says, وَالْمَعْلُولِ عَلَى الْعِلَّةِ وَالْمَعْلُولِ عَلَى الْعِلَّةِ And the outcome and its reason. Can any outcome happen without a reason? يعني مثلا, a book falls down. Uh, either someone put it on the shelf and he didn't put it properly. And it's fall down. Either the wind hit it. Either someone dropped it. Even if the jinn came and dropped it. It's not going to drop except through a reason. Uh, 
It's nothing is going to happen without a reason. For over here, when something drops, it means something had occurred for it to drop. يعني even يعني another example, a person falls over, someone pushed him, or he tripped on something, or he didn't tie his shoelaces. Something happened for him to trip. For Ibn Al Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi is saying that everything has a cause and effect. Everything has a cause and effect. يعني even miracles, when we think about it, when the moon split, what was the reason of it? Allah subhanahu wa taala. It, nothing just happens out of nothing. Nothing happens out of nothing. This is what Ibn al-Qayyim try, is trying to bring. Nothing happens by its, yani without a reason, without a cause, without an effect. And we'll get to this with the topic of Qadr and how this all ties together, insha'Allah. But then the last thing Ibn al-Qayyim says, وَالْمُسَبَّبِ عَلَى السَّبَبِ And the cause and the effect. Yani every effect has a cause. These three principles, Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi says, these three principles, Ibn al-Qayyim says, can be found in the Qur'an over a thousand times. That nothing happens except for a reason. There's always a cause and effect. There's always a reason why something happens. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahmatullah alayhi, something interesting, he says a thousand times, specific, he says over a thousand times. Not just a thousand, over a thousand times. What does he show us? He could have said over 100, 200 times. It would have been a safe bet. Yani he could have just said 500 times, yani half it. And just be safe. But he says over a thousand times. It shows us two things. The first thing is how important this is in the Quran. The second thing it shows us is the depth of knowledge Ibn al-Qayyim had with the Quran. His relationship with the Quran. He didn't say a thousand, under a thousand. He said over a thousand. And the Salaf and the Ulama are very, very, very specific when they say a certain thing. Yani, I can, like if I had to make a single bet in my life. يعني it would be that this is it's not 999, it's over a thousand. If Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi says it's over a thousand, it's over a thousand. For this shows you, يعني betting is haram by the way, يعني disclaimer. But it shows you the depth of knowledge that Ibn al-Qayyim and the relationship Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi had with the Qur'an. That he knew يعني the intricacies of the Qur'an. The ins and outs of the Qur'an, even when it came to counting the topics of the Qur'an, and inshallah, you can see the type of depth of this knowledge in the next chapter, inshallah. He's going to give you examples, and I, يعني, I don't want you all to يعني, lose track of the main image here. Cause and effect. And he's showing you, يعني, he's saying now it's over a thousand times, it is going to give you the usul of each of them. How you can look for it in the Qur'an if you wanted to look for cause and effect. Where something happens for a certain reason. And he's going to give you the different uslub that it comes in the Qur'an. The different ways that it comes in the Qur'an. Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi says, he starts off with, In places, the universal and legislative judgments appear and are arranged in the most appropriate manners, such as the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَلَمَّا عَتَوْا عَمَّا نُهُوا عَنْهُ قُلْنَا لَهُمْ كُونُوا قِرَدَةً خَاسِئِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So when they were insolent about that which they had been forbidden, we said to them, be apes despised. Before we go into what Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi is, يعني, what he's showing, the story behind this, Generally, I don't want to give you the ins and outs of the tafsir, is but there was, يعني, it's from the, the people of Israel, Israel, and they had their sabbath, the sabbath, that they had to hold certain laws. And one of them is that they can't fish during this, يعني, the sabbath, on sabbath. And what would happen was that the test that would happen to them is that the good fish would come on Saturdays. The good fish would come on the sabbath. So this is one of the, يعني, if I'm remembering correctly, but basically what, what they would do is that they would put the, the nets of the fishing on Saturday, but they wouldn't catch. They'd trap the fish. And on Sunday they'd come and collect what they had caught يعني, and trapped. And they were rebuked by the ulama on why they're playing games with the Sharia and why they're playing games. They said, no, we're not, we're not fishing on Saturday. We're only fishing on Sunday. ف... When they breached the laws of the Sabbath, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally 
literally, according to يعني, many of the scholars, changed them and transformed them into apes, into monkeys. And يعني, many of the scholars say that they were wiped away as well. But this was the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for breaking the law. But why is Ibn Qayyim bringing this? Cause and effect. When they were insolent, when they broke the laws, then the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came of them being transformed into monkeys. This is from Bani, Qisas of Bani Israel. And this is mentioned in the Quran. And we believe this. And we affirm this. That this happened. Then, another example. And his statement. فَلَمَّا آسَفُونَ انْتَقَمْنَا مِنْهُمْ فَأَغْرَقْنَاهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And when they angered us, we took retribution from them and drowned them all. When they angered us through sin, we took our punishment upon them. يعني. How did it happen? Cause and effect. They had to anger Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the punishment to happen. Keep this all in mind. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. And his statement, Ibn Qayyim says in his statement, وَالسَّارِقُ وَالسَّارِقَةُ فَقْطَعُوا أَيْدِيَهُمَا جَزَاءً بِمَا كَسَبَا نَكَالًا مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ the thief, the male and the female, amputate their hands in recompense for what they committed. First you, th- you, first you, be- you steal something and then the recompense happens. First you become a thief and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his punishment upon you is halal. Then your hand is up for game. You do the action, you do the sin and then the punishment comes. Cause and effect. And then Allah then he says <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Innal muslimina wal muslimati wal mu'minina wal mu'minati wal qanitina wal qanitat wal qanitina wal qanitati was sadiqina was sadiqati was sabirina was sabirat والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما الله سبحانه وتعالى says Indeed the believing men and believing women until يعني the entire verse and those who remember Allah a lot and the females, Allah has prepared forgiveness for them and a great reward. Yani, to get the forgiveness, forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to be of one of these asnaf of being a Muslim, a mu'min, a qanit, a sadiq, a khashi', a sabir, one of the mutasaddiqeen. One of the sa'imin. Yani these are the ways that you get the get what the ajr of Allah subhanahu wa taala and the forgiveness of Allah. For you have to do this for that. This is who it's for: the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa taala and the reward of Allah subhanahu wa taala. And then Ibn Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi says further similar examples are plentiful in the Quran. And then now this is that was one type. This is another type that cause and effect comes in the Quran and at times it is arranged in the form of a condition and the recompense such as Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu in tattaqullaha yaj'al lakum furqanan wa yukaffir ankum sayyatikum wa yaghfir lakum 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you're pious to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will grant you a criterion, wipe away your sins and forgive me. Yani now it's the, there's a condition. If you do this, then this will happen. But now there's cause and effect. There's a cause to get this reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And his statement, Ibn al-Qayyim continues, فَإِن تَابُوا وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ فَإِخْوَانُكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ If they repent and establish the prayer and pay the zakah, then they are your brothers in the religion. So if they do such and such, then this will happen. And then Ibn al-Qayyim gives another example in his statement. وَأَلَّوْ إِسْتَقَامُوا عَلَى الطَّرِيقَةِ لَأَسْقَيْنَاهُمْ مَا أَنْ غَدَقَا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says And that if they had remained upon the straight path We would have given them abundant provisions Again, for abundant provisions They had to be and stay on the straight path and then Ibn Qayyim says, and there are other similar verses. That's another type where cause and effect comes in the Quran. Another times he says, at times it is arranged using the Arabic letter Lam. So that defines a reason for something to take place, such as Kitabun Azalnahu ilayka mubarakun liyadabbaru ayatih. وَلْيَتَذَكَّرَ أُولُوا الْأَلْبَابِ So that they may ponder over his signs. يعني, the translation is incomplete here. كِتَابٌ أَنزَلْنَاهُ إِلَيْكَ A book that was relieved, uh, revealed, that we revealed to you, that is mubarak, that is holy or blessed. لِيَدَّبَّرُوا So that they may ponder over his signs and so that the people of understanding remember. أخي. The brother. Was the translation correct there? In that verse there, was the translation correct? Because over here we have a mistake. Khair, khair, we'll get to it later, inshallah. The yani the heaven put kitabun anzalnahu ilayk, khalas. Yani they didn't fix that one. And then Ibn al Qayyim rahmatullah, jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. And then Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullah alayhi says, and his statement, لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so that they, may, they can be witnesses over the people and so that the messenger can be a witness over them. Again, cause and effect. Cause and effect. And then, Ibn al-Qayyim says another type at the time at times it is arranged using the Arabic letter K that also indicates the reason such as So that it will not be a, a perpetual distribution among the rich from amongst you. Yani this is why this is for you and this is the reason cause and effect. Hmm? Cause and effect. And then Ibn al-Qayyim says, okay, that's another type of examples. Then Ibn al-Qayyim says, at times it is arranged using the letter Ba that indicates the reason for a particular event such as the statement of Allah and the verse is not there. ذَلِكَ بِمَا قَدَّمَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ The translation is there, that is due to what their hands have put forth. And his statement, again, the reason why something happens is because they did such and such. Another statement and his statement, بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ Due to what they used to do. Yani another result of a certain thing. بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ Due to what they used to earn. And, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا It is because they would deny our signs. This is another reason. And then Ibn al-Qayyim, uh, cause and effect, عفوان. and this is another example of cause and effect. And then Ibn al-Qayyim, rahmatullah alayhi, says, at times it is arranged in a manner wherein the noun is placed after the verb 
in order to highlight the reason for the action, such as the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A man and two women, from those whom you trust as a witness, so that, so that if one of the women is, the other can remind her. And, <clears throat> why it's there? Yani another cause and effect. And Ibn Qayyim continues, and it's just the same thing, the same cause and effect in the Quran in different ways. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Lest you should say on the day of resurrection, indeed we were of this unaware. And his statement. Lest you say the scripture was only sent down to two groups before us. Yani we did this so that you will not say. Huh? Again, cause and effect. Yani disliking the fact that you may say this. At times it appears through the Arabic letter Fa. So, that appears with the reason and prior to the outcome, such as his statement. So they denied him and hamstrung her. So they Lord brought down upon them destruction for their sin and made it equal upon them. And his statement. فَعَصَوْ رَسُولَ رَبِّهِمْ فَأَخَذَهُمْ أَخْذَةَ الرَّابِيَةِ And they disobeyed the messenger of their Lord, so he sees them with a seizure of fierce proportion. Because of this, this happened, cause and effect. And then his statement, فَكَذَّبُوهُمَا فَكَانُوا مِنَ الْمُهْلَكِينَ So they denied them, and they and were, tho- and were of those destroyed. At times, if Al-Qayyim continues, at times, their recompense is highlighted after the Arabic letter Lamma when they such as Falamma Asafuna Intaqamna Minhum. And when they angered us, when they angered us, yani cause, what was the effect? We took retribution. And it's like, yani that's another type. Sometimes the recompense appears after the Arabic term inna, indeed, such as innahum kanu yusari'una fil khayrat. Indeed, they would hasten to do good. Yani, this is why they went because they used to do good. And then the opposite, yani, and Ibn Qayyim says, and the opposite recompense can also appear in the same manner. إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا قَوْمَ سَوْءٍ فَأَغْرَقْنَاهُمْ فَأَغْرَقْنَاهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ Indeed, they were an evil people, so we drowned them all. In other places, I'm nearly finished, I promise, I'm nearly finished. In other places, the recompense is defined using the term لَوْلَا Had it not been in order to connect the opening phase with the succeeding one, such as فَلَوْلَا أَنَّهُ كَانَ مِنَ الْمُسَبِّحِينَ لَلَبِثَ فِي بَطْنِهِ إِلَى يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ Had it not been that he was from those who perform remembrance, يعني Yunus alayhi salam, when he was in the belly of the whale, he would have remained in its belly until the day that they are resurrected. Yani, because of his dua, he was saved. Or he would have been in there till the day of judgment. It's because he did this, this was the result. It can also appear through the medium of law that is conditional. وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ فَعَلُوا مَا يُعَظُونَ بِهِ لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ وَأَشَدَّ تَثْبِيتًا If they had done what they were instructed, it would have been better for them. This last 
Yani page. We have 15 minutes and we won't be able to go through it. Uh, next class, next week, what I want you all to do is just read these verses again. Read these verses before coming to class. Read these verses again because yani, basically all of this is that. Yani, I'll read the first line. The first line. We'll get that. We'll get the first line. In summary, the Quran from beginning to end clearly defines that the recompense for evil and good and the universal occurrences have a reason. In fact, the judgments in the worldly life and the hereafter, as well as their harms and benefits, are all in accordance, are all in accordance to their causes and particular actions. Whatever happens, there's a cause and effect. And okay, we'll continue with the next line. Therefore, whoever truly understands this point and considers it thoroughly will benefit from it immensely, and not ignorantly and erroneously depend on the divine decree. As an, acute, as an excuse for his inability, neglect and squandering of affairs, which will only equate to a reversal of affairs, in that his reliance will amass to non-action, and his non-action will be <coughs> his method of reliance. Basically, he's saying that you can't say that we don't do anything because of qadr. Everything is written. Whereas in the Quran, there's cause and effect. You want to go into Jannah, you have to bring the cause. You want to go into the hellfire, bring the cause. For no one can say that I am just relying upon my qadar, qadar Allah ma sha'a fa'al, and the story. I'm sorted. I'm majboor to this. This is all for this point. That in the Quran, over a thousand times, cause and effect is there. Cause and effect is in the Quran. For you want Jannah, that's the effect, that you, that's the recompense that you want. You have to bring what it entails, you have to do what it needs. There's conditions. And that is what Ibn Qayyim is trying to bring. And he says there's over a thousand verses that have this principle that for every cause is an effect, for every recompense to occur, there needs to be certain things that need to meet a condition. Yani everything has reasons. Everything has reasons. And to re the reason that we do things, yani, and he gets to this, inshallah, we'll go through it next, next week, but just the khulasa of everything, yani the dua is from these reasons. Dua is from these reasons that have an effect. Proving that dua has an effect. This is just for that guy that said, why do we make dua if everything is muqaddar? And we're going through this for two weeks. Barakallahu feekum. Rizakumullahu khairan. وينشط ذاك السقيم العليل وقد كان بالسقم دهر